this presentation today is based on an article that myself, um, Rob Leisure and Aviomi Bayer and Hong Fu Hong Fu Dang wrote um, back in 2021. So we submitted to California Management uh, Review, which is very much a practitioner article. So the presentation is based on that paper today, and it's kind of the joint work of of um, four authors. Have it. So we wrote the paper around digital platforms and inner source. And just before we kind of move on, I want to just talk a little bit about what I mean by the term uh, <clears throat> digital platform. So the term that's used to describe systems or say repositories for sharing reusable components. And what I mean by re reusable components, that's software or data, okay? And um, either inside or outside the organization. But what you're doing is that you're interacting with many different actors or stakeholders inside the organization. So what makes these digital platforms different from say other technology systems that provide resources and expertise to users at scale is that digital platforms, they allow actors to generate additional value simply from interacting with each other, from collaborating with each, with each other, from sharing. So, these kind of digital platforms, what they do is they transform strategy, they transform competition for organizations that are seeking to stay relevant in affected domains. So internal digital platforms, and I must say research to date, the academic research has focused on external platforms, okay? The external sharing of digital platforms or digital components. So Twitter would be a good example, uh, Google Analytics, um, bookings.com. Um, and focusing on external digital platforms makes sense because you know, they're often responsible for kind of wide reaching industry disruption. But we've taken an internal perspective. So we're focusing on internal digital platforms and we're looking at how InnerSource helps create these kind of platforms. So internal digital platforms, they provide the essential foundation for organizations that are seeking to begin to transition to becoming an external digital platform. So, over the past few decades, um, we've seen a strong push for organizations to establish uh, a wide reaching kind of internal digital operational backbone. OK, and this is typically made up of kind of enterprise wide databases and other IT systems. So what these backbones allow is they allow organizations to kind of increase their intra organizational uh, visibility. They can increase the communication, they can spread best practices, they can build up common resources such as data and other kind of specialized skills. But what kind of these backbones mean, these operational backbones mean is that you have, you have teams, um, multiple teams that focus on, you know, smaller scale problems that they can actually address rather than focusing on larger projects that may be more innovative or may create more value. So we're still kind of these structures, they kind of create silos of knowledge and skill development. Um, they reduce things like personal learning, they limit collaboration, um, and they also kind of cause teams to be inconsistent with how they interact with other teams, other developers, other business units, uh, customers, um, and so on. So um, I hope I've explained digital platforms uh, well enough, but just remember they are kind of repositories or systems for kind of sharing software and data. So we look at now at inner sources and management practice. So inner source, it has expanded from its kind of initial software focus to include other kind of forms of sharing and co-creation inside an organization. So when organizations introduce an internal repository that's capable of kind of storing and sharing code, it also creates a really natural foundation for sharing other forms of knowledge, okay, and expertise. And also, you know, these repo repositories, they can provide access to information on product lines, they can promote transparency and improve communication and cooperation among teams. So as you all know, um, being part of the commons. It's about changing the typical enterprise silo-based nature of an organization. It's allowing communities to grow inside an organization. It gives rise to these network effects. So it, it represents an empowering way of involving employees in decision-making. Um, 
and other decisions, implementing decisions throughout, you know, an organization. So what organizations do is they introduce new, new tools and technologies that enable open practices inside an organization. So again, things like software repositories. Um, and this kind of, a, it allows them kind of to leverage, say, the benefits um, of open source, and they don't have to worry then about opening up sensitive information to the public. But while adopting like internal tools and technologies is, is important, these only serve as an enabler of inner source. And in Denise Cooper and Klaas Dahl's book, they talk about this. They said the real changes um, within our source are about sharing more than just the programming code. So, you know, there's a need to look beyond tools and technologies. There's a need to consider people because people have their own habits. They have their own fears, work patterns and motivations. So we position inner source as a management practice. It's part of a management strategy to break down these silos and create new channels of interaction across business units and departments inside an organization. So as I said, it's kind of expanded from its initial um, software focus, more so to kind of breaking down silos and creating a collaborative culture. Um, next slide. So just before I discuss this framework that we, we it's a conceptual framework that we developed as part of this paper, um, for the last couple of years, we've been interviewing companies. So many, many years ago, um, while I was doing my PhD in open source business models, I interviewed a good few people in Philips Healthcare. So the data is from that time, but Philips are still very innovative on the inner source front. And there's a very good article on Medium by David Terrell um, on their current inner source initiatives in Philips. So the paper is based on data collected in Philips and also data collected in, 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 in Zalando. And Hong Fu Deng, who's an author on the paper, um, she works in Zalando. So, you know, there's a lot of participant observations that took place as well. And we also conducted some interviews with, um, with PayPal. So we summarized the data that we found as a four stage model that you can see here, okay? Um, four stages of capture, reuse, share, and open. And I'll talk about them now in a few minutes. But it's a model as well that describes the different types of benefits that can offset kind of any resistance to inner source um, along the way. So I'll go through the different stages um, of this model. Okay, so the first stage with inner source, um, with creating a digital platform using inner source is the capture stage. Okay, so a common concern for many siloed heavy organizations is the localization of knowledge in small numbers of individuals. Okay, and um, often documentation or the archiving of data and code, it may not be sufficiently backed up. It, again, it depends on the individual's or team's work habits and priorities. So the capture stage is vital to create that organizational memory of, you know, code and software and so on developed when you're creating, adapting uh, or supporting various products and services. So for most of the companies in this study, um, their first step was to build a core team to oversee the transition to inner source and establish it as an accepted practice in the organization. So many of the organizations begin with kind of um, pilot inner source projects. All of them started using a repository. Um, Zalando and PayPal, for example, use GitHub Enterprise um, and Philips Healthcare at the time used CollabNet, uh, CollabNet repository. So, you know, others have kind of complemented complement kind of the use of repositories. Um, Zalando uses an API principle which relies on peer review as a, as a way of ensuring quality standards. So introducing a repository that captures all of these, all of the data and the code and the stuff or whatever is very, very important in the capture phase. So the second proposed stage is reuse, okay? So you have organizations who already maintain the consistent 
records of uh, developed components. Okay, so you know, their next question then is kind of like, how do we build on some of, of the things that we, you know, that we did previously to help us with new problems that we're addressing today? So one of the problem, one of the benefits, sorry, of reuse is that you save time. Um, but this only works if you can find code um, quite easily. Um, otherwise, what you have is you've got a repository of, you know, of components that just becomes a black hole. So again, um, the organizations in the study, you know, they made great use of the repositories, GitHub, for example, to store the code. Um, Zalando, they, first of all, they kind of, they, they, they move towards feature teams, okay, kind of cross-functional teams. Um, as a way to help them maintain uh, reuse of components and so on. They also use their GitHub enterprise system to store each team's code, as opposed to putting or storing the code in one or more of the team, team members' individual functions. And they also had an API portal that provides a central repository of approximately 600 APIs. And this you know, encouraged the development of, of reusable data components for all of their deployed services. Philips then, they introduced wikis, which, which were very, very effective, and mailing, and mailing lists, lists to help them kind of reuse um, knowledge. So the benefits at this stage, as I said, is it saves time by reusing digital components, okay? This is an important motivation for organization. Um, they can, it increases productivity because it reduces rework, it simplifies things like planning um, and uh, estimation. But again, like these components, they need to be kind of easily findable, okay? And consistently documented, something that PayPal really pointed out. So that's the second stage. I'm hoping by making sense so far. So the third stage then revolves around sharing. So once an organization can capture and reuse code um, teams, individuals and teams, they'll likely kind of try to zone in on new solutions quickly and with higher kind of quality standards. So these teams, they may, they may find themselves frequently kind of faced with new challenges that extend beyond their own work. So they have to actually interact with others, okay? So the question they'll typically ask is, has anyone already figured out how to solve this problem? And again, this is a huge challenge in many large organizations where teams know a particular problem that's facing them, um, yet they're not sure where to look in the organization if they wish to build on any existing work. So this leads to kind of widespread duplication of work. It leads to kind of you know, missed opportunities for collaboration and learning across the, across the organization. So, the companies in this study, they credit the share stage of the inner source initiative with kind of promoting a really collaborative organizational culture. But this stage, it does require the gradual buildup of trust, okay, so that individuals become open to sharing and, and uh, working together. So each of the companies introduced different initiatives to address some of these issues. So PayPal, for example, they introduced kind of a new role of trusted commissioner. You know, so these kind of individuals would take responsibility for review and, and approval of shared components and all communication was documented and made publicly available to everybody on their repository. Um, so again, there was huge benefits seen in this stage. Again, things like reuse, uh, cross team alignment, um, continuous learning. Um, so it was all about how people work together, okay? There was like increased collaboration as a result of this stage. That's the next slide. So the fourth stage then is where you open digital components. So again, at this point, organization, what they're concerned about is kind of, you know, are there any external groups that can help help us build our components or contribute to our components? 
Um, and Stilando, and I'm using Stilando a lot because I suppose Hong is, a, is an author on this paper, but they introduce a number of initiatives in this stage of the framework. So for example, they, you know, they conduct a number of open innovation hack weeks, okay? They have a technical blog where they share their story of inner source with the public. They've opened up a large number of their projects to the public. So I think they have 201, well, a few months back, they have 201 active projects with 927 active uh, contributors. And they also share an open repository of files for companies that are interested um, in adopting uh, inner source. And again, PayPal are the same. They've got 187 repositories that they make available on their external GitHub platform. So the companies were very, very good with sharing um, what they did um, in terms of their inner source projects uh, with the public, with open source communities and so on. Um, but just going back to this framework, um, so you have the four different stages, but to sum up, a lot of the challenges involved in introducing inner sources around culture. So what you need is you need a mindset of collaboration, okay? So many organizations, they're initially skeptical, you know, um, of kind of forcing inner source on individuals in the organization because you have developers who are concerned about who's responsible for the code if it goes wrong. Um, and as I said, you need the grad gradual buildup of trusts to help individuals and teams become open to sharing and working together. So things like governance, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but governance of inner source in initiatives is vital, okay? Things like putting the core team in place, that oversees inner, inner source initiatives, providing the tools and infrastructure and the guidelines um, for how teams can develop and store and contribute is important. Um, so maintaining close ties to developer communities in this stage is important. Um, and again, like with PayPal, they're, really, they're a really good example of this. They've sponsored the publication of a couple of books around inner source with Tim O'Reilly. They've hosted inner source summits. Um, they regularly speak at conferences and seminars. Um, and their former chief technology officer or head of open source is, is um, created the inner source commons group. So, you know, these kind of initiatives are really, really important for engaging with external communities. So, just to kind of sum up the framework, um, they're all important stages. You've got different companies that are at different stages. Some have got, kind of went through the, you know, the four stages. You know, they're at the open phase and now working with, with external communities. Others are starting at the very beginning. But what executives in each of these three cases in the organization wanted to do is they wanted to change the organization's structure and culture. And it was, inner source was quite effective in doing this. But there are some recommendations, which I'll go through. So the first recommendation is to kind of create a common space to get the ball rolling, okay? So each organization, they started by kind of focusing on a specific subsystem or feature. Now, Class Dahl has wrote a very, very interesting paper. It was published in Tosum. Um, about the factors for adopting inner source. And he does talk about the importance of a seed product, okay? Um, and this is important in this regard, start small, okay? Start with pilot projects. And many of the companies that I've spoken to today have started, you know, with smaller scale um, inner source projects, which have gradually scaled throughout the organization. And as I already said, get familiar with communities. So PayPal, Zalando, Philips, they were all active participants in open source communities. And these communities, they are vital sources of learning. Um, mobilize and empower people to lead the vision. So some organizations are now hiring evangelists or project leaders with the experience to transition, okay, to change the culture. 
Um, we're seeing terms like head of inner source, director of inner source, head of open source. Um, and this is really, really important. You need people, you need champions. Um, and, you know, people that teams respect and who trust, you know, and, and, and you know, they'll listen to them. So incentives are also very important. So, and these are necessary to encourage sharing, collaborating, mentoring. Um, but what was kind of evident from the cases in this study was that reputation and recognition is important for individuals, okay? So in PayPal, for example, establishing the role of trusted commissioner was a reward for those who took on responsibility for code review. Um, so it kind of get them a sense of identity and a sense of control. And um, so incentives are important. Other companies use things like gift or badges, t-shirts. Um, so symbolic extrinsic rewards like that work well as well. Um, another recommendation is to adopt a collaboration tool that connects silos. Now, again, this can be something like GitHub Enterprise, for example, but this tool should support the capture, reuse, and sharing of software and data among all internal stakeholders in the organization. So having a tool that establishes this virtual collaborative environment, it provides a foundation for keeping track of tangible process and ensuring transparency and communication between employees. The next recommendation then is establishing an effective uh, governance process, one that fosters kind of shared norms and one that provides guidance um, on inner source. So unlike many other kind of once-off initiatives, uh, inner source is an ongoing effort, okay? It needs to be actively governed or neutered, in fact, so that it kind of gets internalized into practices and routines of the organization. So in addition to this, there should be leadership, okay? That you know, leadership that provides guardrails, if you like, and direction on what ad adopting inner source means in an organizational context. So each of the companies in this study, they made conscious efforts to ensure that a governance regime was in place, okay? They had dedicated groups and individuals that were championing inner source in the organization. Um, so the key to devising an effective governance process is to strive for an environment that inspires collaboration and motiv motivates people to engage. So this is important because, as I said already, inner source requires a cultural change and mindset for many organizations, a mindset shift, shift for many organizations. Um, so these changes don't come about by themselves. So you kind of need to create an atmosphere where sharing is encouraged rewarded, recognized, and perhaps incentivized, okay? So these are kind of useful governance levers that can kind of help nudge people towards kind of the behavioral changes that are needed to foster an inner source environment. So the last kind of step is, uh, or stage is avoid, or recommendation, sorry, is avoid re reinventing the wheel. So by engaging in a process of um, continuous learning. So uh in this case um continuous learning is really important and again engaging with internal actors throughout the organization and collaborating with them and working with them and engaging with open source communities this all kind of promotes continuous um learning so you know um uh i was going to say one other thing that's gone out of my head but yeah so Avoid reinventing the wheel, engage in continuous learning, um, try and get to a point um, where you have a culture of reuse, avoid reinvention of kind of knowledge or data that may exist elsewhere, and uh, keep up to date then with practices, learn from others' successes. So look to other companies that kind of have implemented inner source quite successfully, but look at kind of the mishaps, look kind of, you know, the challenges that they faced and learn from those. So that's it. Thank you very, very much.